There is a reason why so many people go missing each year and are never heard of again. Despite the resources of entire communities and in some cases even governments, people still have the tendency to vanish without a trace. Ask yourself, do you really believe that some people just vanish out of thin air? In some cases it does happen, but when you look at the amount of missing people that a country has per year, you should know that there is a reason for it. Regardless of what happens to the person or what kind of behind the scenes crimes they commit, the news is all the same. Family man this or charity giver that. I will tell you up front, most of the people who go missing deserve to go missing. And I can speak confidently about this because I am one of the reasons so many people have gone missing. I am what you call a BHK, which stands for Bounty Hunter Killer. There is a whole community of us that operate on the dark side of the internet. The reason I have the K at the end of my title is because some of the best trackers and hunters don't have the morels to kill the people they find. This has never been a problem for me and I am quite glad that my conscience can take it. The people who are willing to execute the target get paid significantly more than the ones who plant blackmailable evidence or set up the target for extortion. Oh yes, there are many ways to get rid of a victim once they have had a bounty placed on their head. It is easiest to think of them as prey instead of people. This is because nobody ends up on the hit list unless they have done some unspeakable crime. Most commonly, we have child predators, serial killers, or very high-end drug pushers. But occasionally, we have a doctor who sells back alley drugs or a boss who exploited their employees to the point that they pooled their money together for him to meet his demise. All in a day's work as I suppose. Though I have numerous stories of my killings, which perhaps one day I will share with you, I am here to talk about the recent one. This happened last winter when I got contacted by my manager. For the sake of anonymity, let's just call him Chuck. Chuck is a certified tech whiz who handles all the details and transactions with my payments. I was skeptical about letting someone in who knows about me and what I do, but in time I realized it is the smarter move to have a tech guy on your team, especially when dealing with the dark web and murder. Vile, my code name. We got a child killer, Wichita, Kansas. Track him down, get the location of the bodies, waste him, $20,000. Attached to his message was some pictures of a torture set up and the body of a woman whose age I am not going to try and guess. Some serial killers really think posting their photos to the dark web is safe. This particular photo had a white male hand and several identifiable items in the background. It appears someone related to one of the victims had been searching that part of the internet in suspicion that she might show up there. Like I said, no one just goes missing. This case would be pretty straightforward. Chuck would analyze the criminal records of white men in Wichita, as well as get the details on the items showing up in the tortured girl's photo. Raid bug spray, a tackle box of lures, in particular largemouth base, and a few disposable vapes. This would be a cakewalk for Chuck. I'm game. I can be in the area by the weekend hack security cameras, and see if you can get a car that at one point or another visited a fishing shop, hardware store, and tobacco store. Let me know what you find. I was greeted with a response immediately. Knowing Chuck, this wasn't all that strange. He probably wouldn't have contacted me if he hadn't already found something. Let's just say that Chuck enjoys the hunt as much as I do, just in a different way. 2017 red Hyundai Sonata going in and out of several of the shops. White guy too. License plate is unreadable from the cameras. I can give you all the roads where I lose him. Luckily, he passes tobacco and gifts every time he has movement. I think I can narrow you down to a few neighborhoods. Good luck. Ah yes, good old Chuck. Any mentioned details on how the child killer meets his demise? make him suffer. This is how the conversation ended with me and Chuck. It was at this point that I headed down to my garage where all of my gear is located. 
It would be a bit of a drive to get to Kansas, so I would get ready early. Since this is the first time I am sharing one of my jobs, I will give you a rundown. In my garage, I have a blacked out 2014 SRD charger, all white with tinted windows. In the trunk, I have my usual tools. Milwaukee chainsaw, two cases of table salt, Beretta plus silencer, tripod, duffel bag, and most importantly, my Soviet WW2 era bomber jacket that I stole out of a Nazi's collection after he met his demise at my hands. This job was going to be creative though. I went to the back room of my garage and loaded up all the cages I would be needing. After getting everything aligned, I called it a night and got ready for next morning's drive. There are other trivial details that I could fill you in on, but we can skip to the good stuff. The real reason why I am sharing this and why you are reading this. Upon arriving at Tobacco and Gifts, I wasn't forced to play the waiting game long. I saw the Red Sonata fairly early and copied down the license plate. It looked like he was heading back to the house or apartment where he lived. After getting the details to Chuck, I was game. Guy's name is Marvin. No criminal record, lives alone somewhere. Google Earth shows that his driveway wraps around to a back basement entrance. I thought it would be tricky getting everything unloaded at his house, but I was in luck. After parking in the street, I only had to wait six hours until Marvin took a hike and left. This gave me plenty of time to pull my car around back, break into the back door which did in fact lead to a basement, and unpack my things before returning to my car and moving it out of sight. Once that was all done, it was going to be the waiting game. I was able to get familiar with the surrounding of Marvin's basement and torture chamber. Except this time, it would be him. Rundown pornography posters hung from the walls. There was a strong smell of musty cigar smoke. I thought this guy was supposed to be a vapor. The rest of the room consisted of trash, except one thing. There was a blood-stained table bolted to the floor with chains. This was the place where the woman's photos ended up on the dark web had met her fate. Alas, she will be avenged. I'll tell you this. Marvin was a bitch. When we walked downstairs face first into the end of my Beretta, he pissed himself and broke down. I didn't need to lecture him very long for him to lay on his table. Look, Marvin, I am not going to hurt you. I know what you did and no police get involved if you do what I say. I need you on the table and chain so you don't try anything. No. I promise I won't hurt you. This wasn't entirely a lie. I wasn't going to be the one to hurt him. Once Marvin was thoroughly chained up, I opened up my duffel bag and tied four tunicates around each of his limbs. Next, I opened up the tripod and began to record. Lastly, I went to the cages in the corner that had my bomber jacket over them and brought them over to the table. Four cages total. In the first cage is the infamous Arizona Bark Scorpion. I got it as a pet from an ex-girlfriend who ironically knew I loved researching arachnids. In the second cage is my Brazilian wandering spider. This one was actually tough to get, but I had a connection in Colombia I met from the deep web who dealt with exotic animals. In the third cage, the most boring in my opinion, is my pet rattlesnake. Eastern Diamondback to be more specific. I call him Salty. And in the fourth cage is the non-lethal giant desert centipede. I will be honest with you. The thing scares the shit out of me. Even now I am a little wigged out that I have it in my house. Marvin at this point gets the gist of what is about to happen. He can't scream or cry because of the gag in his mouth, but the eyes say enough. I double check the camera, make sure the tunicates are nice and tight, then begin. I put on Rapika gloves and grab Satley first. I bring her over to old Marvin's right foot and get her all riled up. When she starts getting snappy, I let her sink her fangs into Marvin's Achilles tendon. I should mention that his feet and hands are white from lack of blood at this point, but his reaction says it all. I let Satley get a few more bites into his foot before I return her to her cage. Bark scorpion time. 
This one is simple because you just need to hold it by the stinger and stick it where you want. This one goes right into the whiteness of the bottom of his foot. Spider time. As I carefully pick up the wandering spider, it bites my gloved hand a few times. This is a bit of a bummer because I want her to save all of her venom for Marvin's right wrist. Either way, she gets a good few bites in that I think did the job. Lastly, we have a centipede. Now I have to admit, I wasn't going to be picking the thing up if I didn't have to. Marvin at this point was almost passed out so, before bringing him back to full consciousness, I untied his hand and stuck it into the centipede's terrarium. After viciously attacking the hand, Marvin got all antsy and started fighting with me. It did him no good. All right now, Marvin, on the count of three. I grabbed all four loose ends of the turnax and smiled at the camera. One, two, three, snap. All at once four different types of venom, three lethal, shot into Marvin's bloodstream. I walked over to the camera and got his reaction. Realistically, only the first 10 minutes were entertaining. Back and forth, Marvin twitched at his spine like he was stretching to do gymnastics. He was fighting his restraints, biting at his lips, and making a kind of screeching noise. Marvin took a while to kick the can. When I walked out of that basement to fetch the car, it was now daylight. I sent Chuck a quick message. Oh my, that BOI is dead. He responded, money in that bank. Fast forward again and Marvin didn't even make the news. His death was completely unremarkable to public attention. Something that you find out all about when you are in this field long enough. Some people dying just doesn't bother anyone. No one cares. And even if they did run his strange deaths, no one would remember after a few days. At least none that didn't know him. I had also completely forgotten to get the girls' burial locations. Oh well. You see, I don't do this for justice. I don't even do this for a paycheck. I do this job because I am completely vile and my blood lust just can't be contained. Even though this is just my first murder I am sharing with you, there are a few lessons to be taken away from this. One, I am a total psychopath. Two, I make my victims pain sharp and deep. And three, feel free to commit crimes and fuck people over. Just make sure that you do not end up on my list of potential bounties. I must say that I am surprised by the amount of people who are interested in my choice of career. I have seen a wide range of comments asking me, is this real? Or, will you write about your other bounties? Let's just say that I completely understand the curiosity. And everyone who asked for more is in luck. I have been a dark web bounty hunter for many years, and as you can imagine, that comes with numerous stories. As flattered as I am with the positive feedback, I must mention that the story of Ole Marvin was actually mild compared to what I have done to some of my victims. As everyone who has kept up to date knows, I only target people who deserve it. There are some truly heinous people in the world. Most of these people live perfectly normal lives. Perhaps one of them is your friend, perhaps it is your boss, in some cases, it may even be a family member. Regardless, if the crime they have committed lands them on my list, I will happily be their judge, jury, and executioner. I understand this isn't everyone's cup of tea. Vigilante work is something that society very much frowns upon, and I can humbly understand your position. But this line of work is how I put food on the table, and I happen to be very good at it. As you can imagine, most of the people I take care of have in some way or another, taken food off someone else's table, or in many cases, robbed them of the ability to sit at a table. If someone is willing to kill, extort, or rape another person, I think they're fair game. With that out of the way, I will share a bounty that I did a few years ago. Before I begin, if you are sensitive to topics such as sexual assault and rape, please do not continue reading as this particular person who ended up on my list was a grade A piece of shit. 
I should also mention that my actions with this person in particular were extremely vile. I will understand if you, the reader, think less of me after reading what I did that day. Seeing what this guy did brought something out of me that I have never felt before. For this reason, viewer discretion is advised. It was April 2020, in the middle of the pandemic. I got an encrypted doc emailed to me from my usual informant, Chuck. If you missed my first post, you know that Chuck is my partner slash manager. He is a technologically genius and, like myself, he has nerves of steel. He and I work together in unison. He finds the information of the people on the list of dark web bounties, and I do the executing. Afterwards, we each walked away with a lot of money. Appears we have a child rapist slash killer. South of West Point, Mississippi. A guy who works as a mechanic. He thought he was anonymously posting to the dark web bounty list. He calls his client Avion, does not have a real name for the guy, and he only gets payments from him in cash. He thinks Avion has something to do with a few high school girl disappearances. One each from Tupelo, West Point, Starkville, and one as far as Vicksburg. Apparently, when working on Avion's truck, he noticed a few bloody condoms and scraps of notebook paper labeled with one of the missing girls' names on it, all stuffed into a waffle house bag in the toolbox, sealed into the back of the truck bed. He was poking around in the truck bed toolbox. He thinks he found the reason why these girls disappeared. Unfortunately, the mechanic, let's call him Wes, can't offer a lot of money, but being a deep South Bible Belt type, he thinks if this guy is guilty, the matter should be placed into our hands instead of the police. Gotta say, I admire that mindset. Let me know what you think, Chuck. I weighed the risks and rewards in my head. It wasn't going to be a big payday, but do I not have a moral obligation to destroy someone like Avion? Bloody condoms and a piece of paper with a missing girl's name on it does not automatically mean he is guilty. I decide to let Chuck do his thing before agreeing. I typed back on the encrypted document. Knowing that Wes is the guy who reported this and that he actually knows Avion makes this easier. But I need a lot more concrete proof that this guy is the reason for the girl's disappearance if I am going to go to Mississippi and annihilate him. Before I hit send, I get a mental image of what this Avion guy might look like. I picture a muscle-bound lumberjack type who thinks he is an absolute badass. The picture of a wannabe tough guy my mind conjured up makes me hate him even more. You want to play that game, Avion? I will swallow your fucking soul and force your mother to bathe naked in your blood. I calm myself down and shake the image my mind created of this guy. I hit send on my message to Chuck and quickly type another. See if you can get in contact with Wes. Check license plates, street cameras, and the whereabouts of Avion. If everything checks out, give Wes a discount and I will S asterisk D asterisk mize ol Avion with a tire iron dipped in glue, glass, and salt. I hit send. I didn't hear back from Chuck right away, which didn't surprise me considering we weren't going to be making a ton of money off this bounty. In the meantime, I went on with my usual schedule. Feeding the arachnids and Salty the rattlesnake, getting old blood in the Dodge Charger floor mats washed out, and fighting the urge to murderously beat the shit out of my punching bag with a Louisville baseball bat, something I have unsuccessfully been trying to stop doing. Face it, the whole world was shut down. There wasn't much else for me to do. A whole week went by before I heard back from Chuck. I didn't bother reaching out to him about the Avion bounty. I wasn't willing to risk being disappointed to the point of attacking my neighbor's lawn hedges with a sickle, something I have unsuccessfully been trying to stop doing. The encrypted message Chuck had sent said, I reached out to Wes, nearly gave him a heart attack when he heard I found out he was the one who had posted to the dark web. He really thought he was anonymous. Anyway, we got some interesting stuff. You would think that he would be a bit more discreet if he is out kidnapping teenage girls. No address or official name that Wes can give. 
This guy apparently only goes by Avion and uses cash payments. Wes did give me some other information. Once I agreed to help him actually make his postings on the dark web anonymously. Avion runs with the Aryan Brotherhood. H looks like he is some big shot neo-Nazi. That's probably why every payment is in cash. It is also why Wes wouldn't confront him about the bloody condoms. That and also Avion would have known that Wes had been snooping. Furthermore, he can be linked to the disappearance of one of these girls. The Studebaker happened to be at a Vicksburg car meet three days before the police report of that missing teen went live. Could be a coincidence, but at this point, does it matter? Why don't you bag yourself a neo-Nazi? Hit me back. Chuck. My reply was, well done. I still need to know potential locations. No point in asking if this is a hunt to kill job. I hit send. Chuck replied instantly to the encrypted document. No set location, but we have a lead. Wes still has the truck and it's not getting picked up for another week. He agreed to let you camp out there and wait for Avion to pick up his wheels. From that point, you can follow him to his destination or take him out on the road. It's a pretty desolate area surrounded by forest. Also about the payment, Wes can give us $300, a signed Conor McGregor UFC glove, and an authentic Corgi model Batmobile he bought on eBay from a guy called Minty Mint. I actually had to hustle him into giving the Batmobile. Is this payment adequate? I replied, I want the McGregor signature. You take the $300 and Minty Mint's possibly authentic Batmobile. Send me Wes's shop location. I don't see a point in adding the details about packing my gear or the drive. You will see shortly how everything plays. The drive itself was uneventful. Upon reaching Wes's auto shop, which is officially named Wes's Auto Shop, I was greeted by an old man with shoulder-length silver hair. Apparently Chuck had told him what I was driving because Wes did not seem all that shocked that an SRD 8 pulled up to his shop. As I stepped out with my backpack, Wes said, now you know I want no trouble with internet folk, but I am confident in the crimes of this Avion character. Your technician said you want to wait here for Avion to show up. I don't need a murder, even by someone of your caliber, right here in front of Wes's auto shop. I'm actually not going to be hanging out here. I plan on putting a tracker on his truck and going to his turf. Anyway, the less we say to each other, the better. You mind showing me the truck? Yeah, second garage bay right here. Before I bugged the truck, I needed Wes to take a hike. As much as I was certain that he wasn't rolling with Avion, I have been in positions before when the caller has played innocent and ended up biting me in the ass. Do you mind leaving me alone with the truck? Wes didn't say anything, just simply shrugged and left the bay. As feeble and old as he was, I decided I was going to put a microphone underneath his workbench in the front right side of the garage bay. Everything proceeded as expected. I tapped the truck underneath the carpet of the passenger side floor mat, under the rear bumper and a third under the engine hood. When I was done, Wes gave me the lackluster payment up front. We didn't say much in the way of goodbyes and I was off. I had made a reservation at a shitty motel that was near the off-ramp of the highway that took me to Wes's auto shop. I checked in under a fake name and paid in cash before going up to my room and setting up a small base camp. Once I checked in with Chuck, I monitored the bugs and microphone that I had set up at the auto shop. At some point, I must have fallen asleep at my laptop because I awoke to a series of loud bangs accompanied by flying glass and wood shards. Shattering plaster and wall insulation clouded my vision as I dove to the floor and pulled out my brand new Smith. The Nazi fuck shot up my motel room and apparently he had friends. After checking myself over, I heard the blare of sirens in the distance. I wasn't planning on sticking around to check if anyone else was hurt. I was far too pissed off to look out for any sad fuck who happened to be staying in the rooms next to me. Instead, I gathered all my shit and made my way to the car. 
If being shot up wasn't bad enough, the motherfuckers had spray painted a dark red swastika on the paint of my all-white SRD8. I suppose being discreet wasn't going to be an option. I wouldn't have time to check for bugs on my own car before the cops and fire department arrived, but I did do a quick scan for any kind of plastic explosive. After being somewhat convinced, I hopped in, fired up the Hemi, and blasted it down the main street. I didn't stop until I reached a remote parking lot of a factory several miles away. As soon as I pulled in, I pulled out my laptop, activated my Wi-Fi hotspot, and sent a distress video call to Chuck. The fucks not only knew I was coming for them, they found my motel and shot the living shit out of my room. What the fuck went wrong? I shouted, Don't look at me, big guy. Everything on the virtual end is secure. It is either Wes who talked or someone followed the out-of-town car leaving his shop. I didn't get to respond before I heard the sound of motorcycle engines roaring in the distance toward me. I told Chuck I've got company and hung up without another word. It turns out my car was bugged or they had some sort of lookout following me from the motel. Nonetheless, I was pissed off enough to deal with whatever the fascists were about to throw at me. I jumped into the back seat of the charger and strapped on a bulletproof vest underneath my Soviet-era bomber jacket. The windows of the charger are totally blacked out so my attackers would shoot toward the front seats first, but as seen back at the motel, they will probably rain hell down on the whole vehicle. As they pulled into the parking lot, I discreetly climbed out of the back seat on the opposite side of them and laid with my back to the rear wheel. The shots rang out for 15 seconds straight. Broken glass covered me and sliced up my face and neck. Bleeding badly, I waited for a reload gap to check what the situation was. From the brief bit that I saw, two bike headlights were shining about 25 yards from my car. Fire rained out into the body of my car, lighting up the entire parking lot. The warm blood fell from my face. I needed to act quick and fast in case they were willing to shoot until the car blew up. Seeing as all of my heavy weaponry was in my trunk, which was undoubtedly sealed shut from the frame damage, and also in the direct line of fire, I needed to rely on the six rounds in my governor. Immediately after the next break in the firing, I rolled out from behind the back tire to the gap underneath the car. I squeezed off three shots right above one of the motorcycle's headlights. Surprisingly, I heard screams of pain and saw the headlight flicker as the bike dropped down to its side on top of the shooter. This immediately led the second attacker to open fire again, aiming low at the center of the car. I rolled back behind the safety of the hubcap, but I was still nowhere near out of danger. I was still bleeding profusely from the broken glass that had showered me and I was down to three bullets. This became one of those fuck it moments that you sometimes experience in life. You are in the midst of fight or flight and get exhausted to the point where you are willing to suicide for the other person to die. At the next break, I simply stood up and shot the three rounds into the biker. The first shot hit him in the head and he went down with his bike also on top of the other shooter, who was still wailing in pain. The shooter who was still alive was being crushed by two bikes and couldn't fight back. I walked over to him gunpointed, even though I was out of ammo, and checked his condition. He looked at me with hate as blood poured out of his mouth. I asked a simple question. How long has Wes been raping little girls? I don't know anything about raping little girls. The guy who works at Wes's auto shop is named Avion. He said there is only one thing he is scared of, and that's the internet because the internet is undefeated. I noticed the dead man had a helmet strapped to his bike. Had he been wearing it, the headshot might not have been fatal. This is when the idea occurred to me. While still being crushed by his own bike, I removed the second bike and aligned the exhaust pipe with the wounded man's face. I reached over, untied the helmet, and jammed it onto the wounded attacker's head. From there, I pushed the exhaust pipe right into the helmet visor gap. The bike was still running and I could see the exhaust fumes burning and suffocating the wounded man. Before he died from inhalation, 
I wrenched the ungeared accelerator and watched as the exhaust melted my would-be killer's face off. I cranked for around 10 seconds before pulling the bike and exhaust pipe out of the man's helmet. The third-degree burns suffered by the man were quite impressive. I removed the helmet and watched as part of his skin came loose with it. Black soot covered most of his face, but dark orange specks, where the skin got completely melted away, dotted the blackened areas. Steam was still wafting off of his face. His charred eyelids showed no movement behind them. I didn't need to check his pulse to know that if he wasn't dead from all the damage he took from the exhaust, his gunshot wounds would take care of him eventually. I returned to my car and grabbed what little had survived the shooting. After getting the trunk opened, I grabbed my extra ammunition and removed the license plates. Unfortunately, I was going to have to write my SRT off as a loss. I had a quarter stick of dynamite in the trunk and I lit it and put it in the tip of the gas tank. After a brisk walk, I got onto one of the attacker's bikes, 2017 Harley Davidson Iron 883, and rode away as my SRT, 8 Charger, exploded behind me. I was headed back to Wes's auto shop and I knew I wasn't going to be needing any bullets. I had already planned out what was going to happen to old Wes. As I pulled into the shop parking lot, I saw Wes come out of the first garage bay. He probably recognized the sound of the bike I was riding. However, I was not who he was expecting. When he saw me on the bike, he immediately ran back inside the garage bay and closed the door. I dismounted the bike and walked into garage bay 2, which wasn't connected to the first bay, but had what I needed. I wheeled the hand push lawnmower I had noticed during my first visit out into the parking lot and went back in to grab a roll of duct tape from his workbench. I leaned next to the side of garage bay 1's door and lightly knocked. As I moved out to the side of the door, an explosion of twisted metal ripped through the steel door. Two quick blasts, one preceding the other. The damage done to the door told me this was a 12 gauge and the quick succession of shells told me it was a double barrel. Wes had fired two shotgun shells through the garage door where he presumed I was. However, this was expected. He was a cornered old man paranoid of the mean people on the internet. I could hear him trying to reload the shotgun, but it was too late. I leisurely walked up to the massive hole in the door he had made. I took careful aim and fired a shot that grazed the old man in the shoulder. He went down like he himself got hit by a 12 gauge. I made my way through the massive hole in the metal door and approached Wes. After kicking the shotgun away from him, I saw all hope leave his face. I leisurely walked up to the garage door opener doing the famous Conor McGregor billionaire strut. Opening the door, I walked out and grabbed the lawnmower and brought it right up to Wes. He was screaming and saying something to me, but I was too distracted thinking about whether there would be any UFC fights during the pandemic. I duct taped the mower's safety handle down and cranked the cord until it started up. I carefully set it upside down so that the blades were facing up. Still thinking about other UFC-related topics, I fought off Wes, who was trying to prevent me from taking his boots off. The old man kicked and struggled, but he was just too weak. With his boots off, I took off my Soviet-era bomber jacket and threw it a safe distance away. I grabbed his left leg and sheared off his foot up to the heel in the lawn mower blades. At this point, I was covered in blood. The spray didn't bother me, I just wanted to spare my jacket from the blood. With Wes's left foot essentially just a heel, I repeated the same action with his right leg. He was screaming, but I still wasn't paying attention. The only thing running through my mind was if I could find another SRT, eight on Craigslist for a reasonable price. With two sticks for legs, I turned Wes, or should I say Avion, around and grabbed him by his right forearm. He wasn't able to fight it anymore. Bastard. I shared his fingers and hand off up to the palm. Once again, I repeated the action with the left hand. Wes now essentially had bloody poles for limbs. Before I shut down the lawn mover and let it die, I brought Wes's face to the cutter and guided his nose into the blades. 
The cut was actually very clean. It looked a bit like cutting a sausage with a weed whacker. Bit by bit, the nose disappeared into the spinning blades. Quick clean cuts. Once his nose only had a few millimeters left, I took inventory of the room. The garage bay was a mess. I calmly walked over to the workbench and grabbed a Phillips head screwdriver and a box opener he happened to have. Walking back to Wes, I knelt down and cradled his head in my lap. I proceed to skewer the Phillips head into both of his eardrums almost up the handle. I then took the box cutter, flicked it open and jammed it into his mouth. I was filleting his tongue with the expertise of a third grade Cub Scout who tried gutting his first fish. I got up and inspected my work. Wes had no digits on any of his limbs, no nose, eardrums, or tongue. I looked around Wes's shop until I found his cell phone and went back to his dying corpse and took a selfie with a thumbs up. I then texted the photo to myself, popped out the SIM card, and crushed the phone. Like I said, this all happened in April of 2020. I never really got to the bottom of what happened to the Mississippi girls. I assume it was Wes, but I can't say for sure. I only do the jobs I get paid for, and I did leave this whole ordeal with a signed Conor McGregor glove. I never heard anything else about old Wes. I actually left him alive in the bay, even though I don't think he survived much longer. If I had to guess, Wes is crawling the floors of hell deaf and mute thinking about the time he decided to waste my time on a serial rapist. Well, there you have it, folks. I don't really feel the need to go into detail about my journey home or the aftermath of the whole ordeal. As always, I licked my wounds and got ready for the next bounty that presented itself. You all asked for another bounty, and here it is. I hope you all leave this satiated for a little while. I stated this before, and I feel like it is fitting to do so again. You can feel free to commit horrible acts on people. Many people in this world are rapists, murderers. Do whatever the hell it is that you want, but just make damn sure that you do not end up on my bounty list.